All right, I guess it's uh, 4.45, I'll get started. Um, I'm going to talk about some uh, emerging API designs and uh, some buzzwords and how the buzzwords might even be useful this time. Uh, before I dive in, I'll introduce myself. I am Eric Baer. Uh, I work at Formi Formidable in Seattle, and we do uh, JavaScript applications for some of the biggest um, sites uh, out on the web. Uh, most recently, I've been doing some pretty cool work for Starbucks on bringing their mobile ordering platform to the web. Uh, it actually just launched the menu portion of that in the UK. You can go check it out. It's very exciting for me. Um, also, Formidable just opened a new office in London, and we're hiring. So anyway, enough of that. In we go. Um, depending on what you work on day to day, you may be wondering things like, why do we need more tooling? Or why do I care about emerging API designs? REST works fine. I don't know. These are, it's, it's a damn good question. And to tell you the truth, all of the new tools has me dragging my feet a little bit. Um, here's why you should care. Uh, the benefits gained from any new tool or technology have to be weighed against the cost to bring it into a system. There's a lot of ways to measure that. There's the time to learn. There's the time to convert what you have now. The overhead from maintaining multiple systems during the rollout, on and on and on. And because of the high cost of the tools, any new tech has to be better or faster by a huge amount. Incremental improvements, while exciting and kind of fun to talk about, just usually aren't worth the investment, at least not for an existing system. Maybe if you are doing greenfield work, that's different. Um, these new tools, like GraphQL, are, in my opinion, a huge step forward, and they more than justify the cost. Um, it's easy to jump right into the sales pitch about all the wonderful features that something has, but you know, even Perl had a really nice marketing pitch and a pretty good website at one point, and you know, I, I honestly think that that misses the point. So, to understand why these tools exist and what makes them great, um, I want to go back a little bit and talk about APIs in general uh, and the problems they're trying to solve and some of the trade-offs in design that they made that got us to where we are today. So let's go back in time. Uh, the first step was uh, the 60s. Um, you know, I was going to make a joke about the 60s, uh, but when I did a little bit of research, I found the most useless sentence on all of Wikipedia, and it has a citation. So I'm just going to leave that there. Um, <laughs> Anyway, in the, yeah, in the 60s, uh, computers were large enough and expensive enough that API-driven uh, application development that we kind of take for granted was mostly just theoretical. Uh, because of bandwidth, computation, and other performance constraints, most APIs were just a mechanism to run code on a remote computer. Uh-oh. There it goes. Um, from the 60s with ARPANET all the way up into the 90s with things like CORBA and RMI, or the Java Remote Method Invocation, most computers interacted with each other just by using a pattern called remote procedure calls, uh, which is just a client-server model whereby a client causes a procedure or method to, to execute on a remote server. In other words, a server exposes uh, its methods such that code written against it looks more or less uh, sometimes less indistinguishable from the code written against uh, the local methods, which can create a kind of uh, continuity uh, to otherwise disparate systems. And, you know, there were actually a lot of really good things going for RPC, despite its, uh, some of the bad things. Um, the ability to tr treat a remote environment as if it were a local one, albeit slower and less reliable, is actually really appealing, and in a lot of ways ahead of its time, like other stuff that came out of ARPANET. Um, since then, there's been a tremendous amount of research uh, into how to allow developers to embed asynchronous or unreliable interactions uh, into sort of the normal uh, flow of a program. Overwhelmingly, these, uh, the research has been in language design, uh, and it's possible that had things like promises or futures or scheduled tasks uh, been around, then the API landscape now would look pretty different. Um, there were, however, a lot of things that made RPC really difficult. Uh, first, with continuity comes context. What I mean is that RPC by design creates a lot of coupling between local and remote systems, uh, and it's uh, tough to lose all of the boundaries in your code. I mean, you have to have some of them. Um, more important is the proliferation of API methods. In theory, a small, thoughtful API surface is exposed that can handle any task, 
but in practice, as a client grows, there ends up being kind of a huge number of external endpoints. And if it wasn't bad enough, the APIs expose such specialized methods that there's often overlapping functionality and sometimes outright duplication. Some of this could have been solved with introspection and tooling, but often that wasn't practical. And you know, honestly, it's 2017 and we still don't really have auto-documenting APIs and that sort of tooling. So it would have been a lot to expect from, from uh, this level of uh, API. So the next major type to come along was SOAP. Uh, and I can see some of you already cringing, see you in the front row, <laughs> uh, which was born in the late 90s at Microsoft Research. And it was intended to address some of the practical drawbacks of RPC by adding structure to APIs. Um, SOAP is just a messaging protocol for exchanging structured information. It tried to be cross-platform uh, and extensible as sort of a foundation for complex API development. SOAP was among the early moves in the direction of resource-oriented APIs, since using a SOAP endpoint, you could request the data of a predetermined structure uh, instead of thinking about the methods required to generate that data. So SOAP 2 had some good things going for it, despite its sort of unbearable verbosity. Um, it, it started a move away from procedural APIs and more towards a declarative data model. Uh, contracts uh, ensured predictable results. Uh, it had the ability to auto-generate uh, documentation and to integrate with IDEs when that worked. Uh, the big revelation of SOAP, though, and SOAP style services, was the introduction of more resource-oriented calls and the guaranteed client-server contracts. The biggest downside of SOAP, which I'm sure all of you know, uh, is that it was almost impossible to use without tooling and lots and lots of tooling. You need special tooling to write tests and special tooling to inspect responses and special tooling to parse all of the data. I mean, it, it's, it's just XML, but you know, there's a lot of it and Charles, I don't know, it, it, it was not easy. Um, it's possible that this was just a part of the 90s Microsoft strategy. Uh, SOAP is still used in a lot of older systems, but the hard requirement of tooling makes it kind of cumbersome for new projects and the number of bytes uh, needed, as some of the earlier talks uh, pointed out, uh, for the XML structure makes it kind of a poor choice for serving mobile devices or more chatty internal uh, networks or microservices or that sort of thing. So the last design pattern uh, for API development is REST. Um, REST was introduced in a doctoral dissertation by Roy Fielding in, uh, in 2000, and it swung the pendulum in a fully different direction. REST is it's really an antithesis of SOAP, and looking at them side by side makes you sort of feel like his dissertation was like just a rage quit. Um, I actually reached out to UC Irvine. They were kind enough to share some rare footage of uh, Dr. Fielding working with a SOAP API just weeks before he met with his thesis advisor uh, on the foundations of REST. Um, so, SOAP used HTTP as sort of a dumb transport and uh, built structure in the request and the response body. REST, on the other hand, threw out the client-server contracts, the tooling, the XML, the bespoke headers, and replaced it all with just HTTP's semantics and its structure. It uses standard HTTP verbs like get, put, and post. Uh, to fetch and update data, and the URIs uh, represent uh, the resource in some sort of hierarchy. So REST changes the thinking from modeling interactions uh, to um, with and programming remote services to just simply modeling the data of a domain. In other words, REST is the full pendulum swing over to being resource oriented. A developer no, no longer needs to know or care what it takes to retrieve a piece of data, nor are they required to know anything about the implementation of the backend services. It's simple compared to the patterns that came before it. It's easily cacheable. It's simple to scale because REST is, by definition, stateless, if you do it right. Um, and since the model, it models the data rather than anticipating a client's needs, hopefully, you have reduced the surface area of your APIs. You can just provide the model and let the client decide how to stitch it all together. So simple to implement, simple to maintain, simple to scale, simple to consume, but REST, like all silver bullets that have come before it, is not without its flaws, and nobody talks about them. But to talk to con concretely about some of its shortcomings, I want to go over um, an example of REST, just so we have a bit of, of context, um, which I will come back to a, a few times in the talk. So I want to pretend that we've been asked to build the landing page of a blog. Uh, which will just display a list of posts and their author's name. 
So first, we will get uh, posts from the post endpoint, and our API will return a list uh, of URIs required to fetch the additional resources. This is a well-structured REST API. I'm sure some of you have seen these maybe once or twice. Um, next, uh, we fetch data about each individual post. And finally, we fetch uh, the author for each post. So, now we have all the data that we need, and it's really well organized and pretty easy to reason about, but it took us eight calls in the client to get here. So the ergonomics of developing both REST clients and REST servers are certainly better than what came before it, but it, a lot has changed since uh, Fielding's paper almost two decades ago. Oh, that was supposed to animate. Oh. Um, at the time, we were in the middle of sort of an explosion of personal computing. Uh, every year, processors would double in speed. You could get more and more memory. Devices and networks were getting faster and faster. And then mobile computing came along, and we immediately regressed like a decade, which has forced us to rethink some of the assumptions that REST made when it was first starting out. So that brings me to the three main weaknesses. It is very chatty. It returns way more data than you'd ever need. And it lacks any sort of tooling or contracts, as uh, another talk has pointed out, um, to uh, uh, help you work with the data. So the first and most important thing I want to point out is that REST services tend to be really chatty. And what I mean by that is it takes a lot of back and forth between a client and server to get all of the data you need, which can be pretty devastating uh, to the performance of your app. And like the skeptics that you are, I can assume you're saying something like, whatever, man, it's 2017, networks aren't that bad, or I was streaming Game of Thrones during my commute. I'm going to quantify my claim because you'd be wrong. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour and talk about mobile devices and how they work, how their radios work, and a little bit about how HTTP itself works. So prepare for a detour. Um, so the first problem is latency, um, which is the amount of time that it takes data to move through a network, not to be confused with bandwidth. Whether you're sending one byte or one gigabyte, this is constant for any given network type. So for wired networks, uh, we're talking about moving electrons through copper or maybe light through wire, depending, or some sort of mix. Um, for mobile uh, networks, things get considerably more complicated. Uh, the latency for today's fastest uh, 4G network uh, is about 55 milliseconds, so um, about double. And for 3G, which still covers most of the world, uh, and T-Mobile, um, it has a latency of almost an order of magnitude higher than a wired connection. So the only important thing to know about latency is that there is overhead for every single request, and no amount of technology can overcome that. It is a, it is a law of physics. You have latency. Fewer requests is better. So I want to think back to the example blog. And if you take those latency numbers and you imagine a best case scenario, you've got a new phone, you've got a reliable network, you've got a 4G connection, you're going to spend almost a half of a second, which is nearly 100% of a pretty reasonable performance budget, just on overhead, pure overhead. You haven't even downloaded the first byte of data. These numbers are not taking into account server speed. They don't take into account um, the time it takes to download things over the wire and certainly doesn't take into account the time it takes to render a UI. Granted, this is specific to web, but these sorts of numbers can be extrapolated into, to, into other domains. And you know, I'll acknowledge that H2 or HTTP2 um, has the potential to improve this situation a great deal, um, but you know, it's not that well supported yet. Um, I think uh, Nginx just released their, um, their H2 compatibility a few months back. Um, Caddy has had it if you're working with Go, lucky you. Uh, JavaScript has it on the roadmap, but I was listening to a podcast from one of their developers, and apparently it's hard. Um, so that won't happen for a while. Um, anyhow, H2 will help, but uh, I just think that's not worth talking about quite yet. So if that wasn't enough, there's another problem, and it has to do with how the TCP uh, protocol works, which is what underpins HTTP. The long and short of it is that nearly all connections are made over an asymmetrical network. A data center will have a much, much higher bandwidth connection than that of a mobile device, and if it were to send data at 100% of its capacity, the mobile device would be immediately overwhelmed. Um, so to solve this problem, TCP does something called slow start. So you don't really need to worry too much about these graphs, but 
Slow start just means that the, the server will send information progressively faster until the client starts failing, until it stops, starts dropping packets, or yeah, there's actually a couple of mechanisms. Um, the implication of this is that one big request is often much, much faster than lots of small ones, since a large request will spend more time downloading at the network's full capacity. The last piece of how this matters is how mobile devices, and specifically their radios, work. Um, I don't, I'm not going to get into this too much, but uh, the radio is probably the most battery intensive, well, apart from the screen, the radio is probably the most battery intensive part of a phone. And in an effort to improve battery life, the operating system is constantly trying to turn it off. So not only does starting the radio increase the cost of the request in addition to the latency overhead, but it will drain the battery life pretty quickly. So the next problem with REST and REST services is that they just send way more than you need. API authors, I don't envy them in particular. They have to anticipate every possible need, all use cases. So more often than not, they send a complete uh, payload that represents uh, sort of everything they know about any given resource uh, at, a, at, a, at a piece of time, regardless or, or, of whether or not the client needs it. Sure, you, uh, you get some help with references, things like author. Um, you can offload that to separate resources, but th that can only go so far. Um, so in our blog example, all we need is the post's title and the author's name, which is about 17%, or six times loss, 6x loss, um, of what we actually got back. In a real-world API, the amount of data overhead can be just enormous. Um, so the final thing uh, that REST APIs lack are mechanisms for introspection. Um, I'm also not going to dwell too much on this, uh, but without a contract between the client and the server, there's no way to really <clears throat> generate any documentation reliably, create any tooling reliably, create any, any uh, um, type guarantees reliably, or have developers interact with the data um, like there was using a WSDL and WADL with SOAP when those worked. Um, to be honest, I, can, I think I can count on one hand the number of times I've used incredibly well-documented REST APIs. I mean, it's possible. Nobody does that. Um, OK, so there are, of course, a lot of people who are trying to solve this problem in a, a couple of different ways. Some people end up just writing custom endpoints that sort of coalesce things together um, for mobile development. Um, there are things like OData uh, and JSON API, which are really thoughtful wrappers uh, around REST that can help you get sort of a grip on, on documentation and, and some of the guarantees. But maybe, though, with an understanding of the things that have worked and not worked in the past, and with some of our new constraints, we can talk about a foundation uh, for something totally new instead of incremental improvements or a wrapper around what we already have. So with new constraints and two decades of research and languages that are enormously more capable, how can we improve? So let's kind of sketch out what we might want or need. Um, so the first, if we were building any sort of new API, we would say we absolutely need minimal traffic. Um, we know there's a pretty high overhead associated with network requests from latency, from battery issues. Um, we want to send as much data as we can on each request. But we also know that the average client is resource constrained, likely in CPU, in memory, and in bandwidth. So we kind of want to only send what the client needs. To do this, we might need some way for the client to ask for the data that it wants. Um, another thing that we've learned the hard way is that uh, we need an API that is easy to interact with. Uh, otherwise, people will just grimace uh, over beers later. Um, we need to be able to use curl, tools like curl and wget and charles, the things that we're used to, uh, to interact with it. We need to just pop open Chrome DevTools and, and look at how something works. Um, the next thing is that uh, we would like for it to be tooling rich. Um, Something that we learned from SOAP is that the ability to have and in inspect an API when it works is amazingly useful. In a dream world, we would like sort of the lightness of something like JSON or YAML, uh, something simple, but th uh, a way to uh, introspect it, um, something, that, something that, is, um, that has some guarantees to it. And the final thing, um, which you may not have, uh, have seen as much of, is, is uh, the ability to preserve local reasoning. 
So over the years, uh, we've developed some really nice ways to organize code. Every project's a little different, but for the most part, uh, all bits of code relating to any particular feature or function are sort of contained in one area. Um, it would be really nice if we could encapsulate each component or module's data along with the rest of its functionality. Um, otherwise, we just end up with a whole bunch of really modular code and then a central data access layer that is coupled to everything. Um, so, all right, what, what might that look like? Um, and if we imagine, uh, let's imagine how we might fetch data for our, our blog example. So on the right, we describe the data that we need in a format, I don't know, it looks similar to JSON, but uh, it's structured. We, we ask for what we want. Uh, it's nice and readable. The query says that we want posts, and from each post we want the title and the author, and from the author we want the name. So if I send that to the server, I might get something back kind of like this. We have a list of posts, and in, inside of each one is the data that we requested. And if it were possible, it would fulfill our wish for minimal payloads, sure. Uh, we've been able to convert our eight requests into one. Um, it also fulfills our need for minimal HTTP traffic, but modularity and local reasoning are not great here. Um, if our blog has an author component and a post component, for example, requesting data all at once like this would break, break all sorts of best practices. Um, principle of least information or locality or encapsulation or you know depending on how you look at it. So if we were to break, uh, break a query up uh, in this way, we could give each post component the data it needs to render. We might do something like this. But now we've broken our, our minimal HTTP strategy from before. And in a real app with dozens or maybe hundreds of components, um, data back to UI components, that is, um, it could be even more chatty, you know, potentially worse than before. So we can fix that, though, if we merge those two into one at build time, or I guess at runtime. Um, and, the, and the way to do that would be to use a query language. If we were to use a formal query language, we could do all sorts of interesting things on the client or the server, like request batching or combining queries at runtime, uh, prefetching data, um, that sort of thing. So the last item on our wish list was tooling. Something that earlier protocols maybe got right um, was allowing the server to publish the schema that defines its data. Um, by using a strongly typed schema, uh, tools can statically analyze, combine, or process requests at compile or runtime. If we expose the schema along with our API endpoint, we could write all sorts of toolings, uh, tooling that did things like IDE integration or query validation or data exploration. OK, so this is the part where I tell you I lied a little bit. Some of you may already know this. Uh, these types of APIs in some form or another have been emerging all over the place over the last couple of years. Um, so just to talk about a few. Uh, Meteor has been trying to improve on the REST model by removing the distinction between client and server entirely, with uh, similar actually to RPC, uh, with its sort of uh, client side MongoDB abstraction. Uh, in Meteor, you interact with the data store um, almost directly. Uh, it inspired people to think pretty differently about client server interaction styles, but it was built on a huge amount of non standard tooling and didn't really gain the mind share that its developers or investors uh, had hoped. Um, RethinkDB, uh, rest in peace, uh, launched Horizon, uh, which was a wrapper around their real-time database, uh, which was sort of similar to Meteor, but uh, built on more standard tools. Uh, it, it had a heavy focus on collaborative reactivity, uh, things like Google Docs and, and chat, uh, real-time information. Uh, but it, it was trying to do so, at least solve some of these problems. Um, I'm actually sure that there are others coming out of other communities I'm, that I'm less involved in. Um, but there have been two lately that have stood out as, as both practical and interesting uh, and general purpose. So th the first is Falcor, uh, which is the engine behind the Netflix UI. Um, and their motto uh, is one model everywhere. Uh, just because a piece of data is remote doesn't mean that you have to fetch it in any different sort of way. Uh, in fact, your client should be more or less unaware of where the data lives. It should concern itself solely with asking for what it needs. Its semantics are really simple, and the code is actually really easy to understand. Uh, it, uh, the, uh, and making queries, it's sort of a modified uh, JSON uh, notation. So that's also really nice. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, its lead maintainer is Jafar Hussein, who is a fantastically well-spoken developer and a member of the JavaScript governing body. 
Um, he built uh, Falcor around uh, JavaScript's new observable streams, which is kind of neat. Anyway, if you get a chance to see him talk, um, it's, it's well worth your time. So the last of these is GraphQL, which was extracted from Facebook stack um, in, I think, 2015. Um, interestingly, instead of releasing code, though, Facebook released GraphQL as a spec, um, which was followed shortly by a reference implementation in JavaScript. Uh, and uh, a little bit of tooling to show off some of the interesting capabilities. Uh, since GraphQL is a spec, though, uh, implementations have popped up in all sorts of languages, Ruby, Scala, Java, um, C Sharp, Python, Elixir, it's sort of uh, you name it, whatever your back end of choice is. And, you know, I kind of really like Falcor, personally, but it's, it's impossible to overlook GraphQL's dominance um, or Facebook's marketing machine. Um, and it sort of rocketed into popularity, um, if you couldn't have guessed, by the number of, of different uh, languages it's been implemented in. Uh, the most recent headline is that GitHub will provide a GraphQL endpoint as an alternative to its uh, REST API, which is serving about 60% of all of its uh, database reads. So this is, a, this is not sort of a side project for them. It's a, it's a pretty big thing. You know, for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to focus on GraphQL itself and its semantics. And since I can't really imagine a better description than their homepage, I'm going to kind of rip it off. Uh, this is pretty much what's on the homepage. Uh, in GraphQL, you describe your uh, graph of interconnections. Your client asks specifically for the data that it needs. Uh, and the GraphQL returns uh, a result of more or less the same shape. Um, if you haven't noticed already, everything on this slide from the type definitions to the data looks pretty much just like what we modeled in our Dream API. Um, I'm going to walk through a, a demo of GraphQL, actually. Um, but before I wrap up this section, I want to talk a little bit more about GraphQL's more interesting properties, should you decide to pursue it any further. Um, the first is GraphQL is a spec, not an implementation. Um, and that spec only defines the type system for describing your data and a really simple query language. GraphQL isn't backed by any particular data store or database or fetching mechanism. Uh, in the same GraphQL server, you could fetch data from Redis and the, an, an address API and your internal microservices all at once. Uh, and the client would never know the difference. Um, after working with GraphQL a while, I began to realize that this is kind of how I've already been building software for years. There's almost always some sort of translation layer or orchestration layer or transformation layer or DAO layer or whatever you want to call it that will ingest data from multiple sources often, transform it into something that uh, later steps in the process, maybe a client, maybe not, can work with more easily. Uh, GraphQL is really just a generalization of that data access in a thin and platform agnostic way. And by the way, when I say thin, I actually mean it's really small. Uh, the whole type system is under 500 lines, which includes comments. And the lexer and parser for the query language comes in at, I think, under 2,000, um, which a large percentage of which is also type definitions uh, and comments. So the next is GraphQL's progressive disclosure of complexity. Um, it really does a fantastic job of making the simple things simple, which you've already started to see. Uh, but it, it also, the hard things are still possible. Um, some things have a really uh, easy learning curve, but real applications are impossible. Some things are the, are the, are the reverse. GraphQL has found some sort of sweet spot. Um, to get immediate use and feedback uh, from GraphQL is really straightforward. You'll see it in the demo. Um, and there's certainly value in just wrapping a REST API one for one such that your clients can use it as an orchestration and filtering layer. Um, uh, but there's an incremental path forward if you want to do anything more complex, uh, you know, batching queries and, and that sort of thing on the client. The last and most important um, is that a GraphQL server publishes what's possible and lets the client decide how to use it. This is kind of what we had intended for REST to be, but really we published a bunch of tables that you have to join, and then you, then you build your UI. So this... Um, a byproduct of this is that when clients, not servers, determine what data they need, their result um, will never change even if additional fields or capabilities are added to the API. So since I really do think that the semantics are pretty simple, I think the best way to show it off um, is with uh, a little bit of a demo. And I figure if I can pull together a live demo in under 10 minutes that goes from zero to GraphQL server, maybe I will have convinced you that it's actually pretty straightforward. It's not a big 
crazy piece of technology. Uh, so wish me luck, live coding. Here we go. Um, uh oh. So I'm going to pull that down here. Oh, good. This is off to a great start. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I work for Starbucks right now, so <laughs> pardon the background. All right. Oh, this, is, this will be fun. I can't see what you see. Um, so I'm going to copy this so I don't mistype it because I was afraid this might happen. Um, I'm going to just make a project directory called GraphQL demo, go into the directory, and run npm init, which is just a sort of create a new project folder in node land. Um, actually, before I do that, uh, I'm going to cd into my dev folder so I don't do this just in a random spot into temp. All right, now I'm going to try that again. OK, and I'm going to just say yes to all the prompts about creating a package JSON, all that stuff. This will be not being able to type this is going to be real fun. OK, so now uh, I'm going to um, install a few dependencies. So uh, again, just so I don't mistype or anything, uh, I'm going to run npm install, and I'm going to save it. It's GraphQL express the express GraphQL bindings and nodemon just to help with that. Uh, so that's a tool that uh, watches your files uh, and auto restarts your server when it sees changes. Um, and express is a, a web application uh, tool. So I'm going to let that run. Should take a second. I have an idea. Bingo. Mirrored displays. <laughs> that should help. Okay. So now we should be done with the really boring part. Just watching things load. It's no fun. How's the, how's the, how can, that's the size. It's pretty, pretty small. All right, hopefully I'll be able to fix that in the text mode. Uh, this is just my uh, dependencies and a file called package.json. Here we go. Yeah, nice and big. Um, called GraphQL demo. It has the four dependencies I installed. That's it. All right, so let's start in. Um, let's create a, sort of an API. We don't have an API. Uh, let's just sort of make a static one. Okay, so we're going to call this data.js. And um, we're going to use the same uh, sort of blog posts thing that, that I showed you earlier in our REST example. Um, so I'm going to start in with, uh, with some posts. Right? I don't need you to have to watch me type all that. Um, and uh, some authors. All right, so now we have some static data to work with, and we need to uh, export it. Um, and got get authors and get posts. So for those of you who may not be as familiar with JavaScript, um, we're just saying go to the uh, authors object and get by ID, uh, and we are saying uh, for get all of the keys uh, in author. Uh, and return them so that we have a list of, of keys so we can get by. Uh, so we have a, a list of authors. Um, OK, so we have a data file. So now we have an API. Let's create a server. So index.js. And um, I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of uh, Express boilerplate. If you're not familiar with Express at all, Express is just uh, a way to start a, a JavaScript server. Um, it is middleware based, so a request comes in and passes through stuff and then goes out. So I'm going to put our first little bit of middleware. Um, so we are just saying at the, at the root, send hello world. So we should have that. And I'm going to add one more thing. And then we should be able to start actually with a, with a real server. 
All right, so this is NodeMon. Uh, all it's going to do is watch this project, and if something changes, it'll restart my server so that I get the update. So we don't really have to worry about that. It's just a nice little dev affordance. OK, so we have a server. Um, let's, let's try it out. And I'll get some bigify the font here. All right, npm start. And let's go here. Localhost 5000. All right, kind of kind of bland, but it is what it is. Hello world. Oh yeah. All right. So now we have a server. Oops, I don't want to save that. Um, so the next thing that we're going to do now we have a server. We have our data. Let's make a schema. We're going to actually start getting into the GraphQL stuff. New file. We're going to call it schema. Surprise. And uh, in this file, we need to model our data. So we're going to start by pulling in some types. Um, these are, uh, this is the type system. So types are not a part of JavaScript, or at least not exactly. Um, so we have uh, some types here. And the first bit of schema that we're going to model, we're going to model the object, or sorry, the, the author. So, so the, we're going to use the object type, because it is an object. And the author has a couple of fields on it. Uh, it has three, if I remember right. It has an ID field. It has a uh, name, and it has a company. Uh, and this one is not a string. It's actually an int. All right, so there's a few more of these. I'm going to kind of skip ahead a little bit. Um, we're going to have post. So here's a post. Now, post is the exact same, except there's two new things. First, we have a list of strings because categories is an array of, of categories. Um, and the other thing is that we have uh, an author, uh, which is of type author, which we have defined above. Oops. Ah, that would have been a problem. How come you guys didn't call me out on that? Um, this is our first link. Now we have two objects that are linked. This is, a, this is our first bit of schema. And the final bit of schema is we have um, our blog, which links it all together. So a blog has posts, which is a list of type post, and a post has authors, or it has one author. So we've kind of defined our graph. Now there's one last little bit, which is sort of a specialized piece, um, and it is the root query. So the root query is your entry point. So your schema lives over here, but you can have any sort of view you want into the schema. Imagine you have a giant graph with all sorts of interconnections. Maybe you want to start, sometimes you want to look at the user, sometimes you want to look at the product, sometimes you want to look at you know, a friend, sometimes you want to look at a post, whatever, you know, you can define a number of entry points. For us, we have a simple schema. So we're just going to assign it to blog. So I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do the root, and I'm just going to say the blog is our root, right? No, no special queries here. All right, so the last thing that we're going to do, now we've actually written some GraphQL, is we're going to wire it in. So let's, uh, let's import GraphQL. Um, Import GraphQL, and we're going to remove this since we don't care about Hello World. And we're going to add GraphQL to it. Okay, so this just means, you know, uh, since it's uh, app.use, that just means when a request comes in, it's going to hit this first. So no need to assign it to a route. All requests will go through this piece of middleware. Um, so let's go here. We're going to refresh the page, and there's an error, which is pretty much what we should expect. We didn't wire any schema up to it. So we have a couple of pieces. We haven't wired anything together. So let's pull in our schema. And now things start to get kind of cool. So when I refresh this page, what you get, hey, this is not supposed to happen. Come on, screwing me over in this demo. This is called graphical. Um, graphical, this is what you would see if you opened it for the first time. Graphical is a uh, sort of a data explorer tool. Um, so let's, let's have a look at our data, actually. So let's, we'll pull open the docs. So the root of our query is a blog. So we're just going to start right in. And a blog has types. It has a post. It has posts. So P, and there's, you see there's auto completion here. And a, and a post has what? It has all these things. So it has a. a what do we care about, actually? We care about the title, not the tags. Title, and we care about the author, 
and from the author, I just don't really need to click, but I will anyway, we only care about the name. So when we run this, unsurprisingly, we get a null. We haven't wired in any of our data, but the server is already publishing its schema. It is publishing what's possible, and I can now interact with it and sort of start to build out the query. So we're gonna do our last step, which is to wire in our data, which is back here. And I'm gonna go to our schema, and I'm gonna pull in our data. Okay, so let's start with the posts. So every field can have its own resolve function. The default resolve function is to do JSON notation, object dot property name. But if you'd like to define a custom resolve function to go fetch data from some external source or transform it in some way, you're free to do so. So for, for now, we're gonna define a custom resolver for uh, posts. So resolve, and it is going to be a function that returns data dot get posts. All right, perfect. Let's run it. There it is. We have data dot get posts, and I'm gonna make this a little bit easier to see. Um, but unsurprisingly, author is null. We haven't uh, wired up our author yet. So we're gonna go up uh, to author. Here it is. And uh, so author is going to be slightly different, but not much. So if we look back at our data, author comes in at sort of this rest format. So let's define a resolver. So resolve, it, it takes as an argument the subtree, which is all of the things here in post. I don't know if you saw my mouse, but it will become apparent in a second. And I'm gonna just put this here so you can see it. So we are going to need the author ID, not this uh, string. So we're gonna do const id equals subtree dot author dot split on slash and we want the second one and now it should be obvious return All right, come on, yes. All right, successfully made my way through a live demo, great. So this is how GraphQL works. It doesn't get much more complicated than that. You can do things uh, in addition to defining the type and a custom resolver, you can add a description, um, which will add uh, extra information. Um, which should come up in the uh, auto, the, the documentation. Everything breaks. Ah, Mr. Comma, thank you. All right. Um, that should come up in the information about author, um, which is nice. Uh, all documentation is uh, in line wherever I put that. Anyway, not important. So the, the, the final thing that I wanted to, uh, to show um, is actually from a, uh, is because GraphQL publishes the schema, you get some really, really interesting tools. Yes, you get IDE integration if you want it, but you also get stuff like introspection queries. And I'm just gonna run this right now. Um, and I obviously don't wanna write this by hand ever. Um, so I'm not even gonna show you, but I'm gonna take the result of this introspection query. So introspection uses this double underscore thing. Um, basically just don't use that unless you really need to. What you can do with that though is auto-generate a, a relationship map. Now, this is not all that interesting, but when you have something that is way more complex, uh, it can be pretty cool to look at all the interconnections of your data um, when you're trying to reason your way through a system. Okay, so now um, I'm going to stop mirroring. And we are back to the presentation. Or not.
Okay. So for the rest of the presentation, um, I went backwards. Right, so that was the demo. Um, for the most part, I've talked about how to write and run queries against a GraphQL server. I should mention a bit about the state of clients. Um, on the client side, the naive approach of just storing a query as a string and interacting with it the way you would interact with a REST server uh, can sometimes be all you need. Um, actually, the, the URL of that graphical tool, um, all you need to do is copy paste that into your curl or Charles or, or uh, whatever sort of uh, thing you'd like to use, and that's all you need. Um, you can use that as just um, the API you've always wanted. Actually, the URL is slash GraphQL query equals variables equals. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's URL encoded, but it's a pretty straightforward thing. Um, and, and that's actually how I've been uh, using GraphQL in production for a while. Uh, in fact, whitelisted uh, static queries are starting to emerge as sort of the best practice for both ease of caching uh, and to protect your server from malicious queries. Um, however, since GraphQL uh, server exposes its schema, there are some interesting things that clients have been experimenting with. Um, some clients have been running queries uh, against a client-side cache, so they only fetch uh, the data that's missing from their cache. Uh, some clients uh, allow you to put uh, data requirements in different parts of your, your UI, and they're coalesced at build time. Um, some clients allow for subscription of data um, and, uh, or server-side patches where the server can uh, do a server push. Um, it's early days, uh, and the landscape is really exciting. Uh, the main thing to remember is that since a complete GraphQL query is just a URL, it's easy to step forward into this stuff pretty incrementally and add the features as it makes sense uh, in, the, in whatever context you're building for. Um, this is all pretty new, but there's been a surprisingly fast uptake across the industry. Uh, the obvious success story is Facebook, since they uh, are the authors of the spec and the reference implementation. Uh, they've been using it actually since 2012. They only open sourced it a few years uh, later. Um, they're currently serving 260 billion requests per day through GraphQL, uh, and it powers their ad manager and the newsfeed. Um, more recently uh, was Newsfeed, uh, or sorry, was GitHub, as I mentioned before, transitioning their API. Twitter and Pinterest uh, have, have become supporters. The Financial Times here in London, um, uh, Pinterest has been a big proponent. Um, and there are a bunch of other large companies that have been, begun to experiment with it, um, although announcements have not yet been made public. So before I close this out, um, I want to say that while I believe that the hype is justified, there is no silver bullet. And GraphQL is also, uh, it's great, but it is not without its flaws. Um, it's a tool that seems purpose-built for good data. And while Facebook may have immaculate APIs, a lot of us have things to work with that need quite a bit of polish and transformation before they go into our schema. Um, it's possible uh, for some uh, of the services that GraphQL hits that they'll fail. And when that happens, GraphQL doesn't return an error. It, inst it instead puts a null in that subtree. It returns as much data as it, as, as it can. Uh, and because of this, clients have to think really carefully about how to handle missing data. Um, analytics and monitoring still have not yet caught up. I mean, uh, you can do it. Uh, but it's not baked in. Um, organizing a large schema is still uh, not entirely straightforward. It depends on how complex your graph of data is. Uh, but it's hard enough that Facebook went out of their way to make a conference talk called How We Organize Our Schema. Um, these are all really solvable problems. And uh, you know, as somebody who's built up a, a fairly complicated GraphQL server, I think that the benefits far outweigh the cost. Uh, but since I picked on the other designs, I feel like it's only fair to have this slide in there. Um, I spent most of the time presenting on why GraphQL exists and some of the problems it solves, and much less time um, on the actual semantics and its uses. Um, if this has piqued your interest, I'd encourage you to go uh, learn in whatever way works best for you, whether it's blogs or YouTube or just you know, reading the source code or, or what have you. Um, that's, all, uh, that's about all I have time to share. And uh, I hope that at least a few of you will explore GraphQL, uh, having some context about how and why it was uh, created. Um, I've been working on GraphQL code in production for a while, so feel free to come grab me, ask me questions if you have them. Um, I'll, be around, uh, I'll be around this evening if you want to grab beers. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, that, is, uh, that is it. I guess I'll come back to you.